Chapter One of the Old Adam: A Story of Adventure by Arnold Bennett. Read by Phil Benson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Adam by Arnold Bennett. Chapter One. Dog Bite. One. And yet edward henry machin reflected as at six minutes to six he approached his own dwelling at the top of bleakridge and yet i don't feel so jolly after all the first two words of this disturbing meditation had reference to the fact that by telephoning twice to his stockbrokers at manchester he had just made the sum of three hundred and forty one pounds in a purely speculative transaction concerning rubber shares it was the autumn of the great gambling year nineteen hundred and ten he had simply opened his lucky and wise mouth at the proper moment and the money like ripe golden fruit had fallen into it a gift from benign heaven surely a cause for happiness and yet he did not feel so jolly he was surprised he was even a little hurt to discover by introspection that monetary gain was not necessarily accompanied by felicity nevertheless this very successful man of the world of the five towns having been born on the twenty seventh of may eighteen sixty seven had reached the age of forty-three and a half years i must be getting older he reflected he was right he was still young as every man of forty-three will agree but he was getting older a few years ago a windfall of three hundred and forty one pounds would not have been followed by morbid self-analysis it would have been followed by unreasoning instinctive elation which elation would have endured at least twelve hours as he disappeared within the reddish garden wall which sheltered his abode from the publicity of trafalgar road he half hoped to see nelly waiting for him on the famous marble step of the porch for the woman had long long since invented a way of scouting for his advent from the small window in the bathroom but there was nobody on the marble step his melancholy increased at the midday meal he had complained of neuralgia and hence this was an evening upon which he might fairly have expected to see sympathy charmingly attired on the porch it is true that the neuralgia had completely gone still he said to himself with justifiable sardonic gloom how does she know my neuralgia's gone she doesn't know having opened the front door with the thinnest neatest latch-key in the five towns he entered his home and stumbled slightly over a brush that was lying against the sunk door-mat he gazed at that brush with resentment it was a dilapidated hand-brush the offensive object would have been out of place at nightfall in the lobby of any house but in the lobby of his house the house which he had planned a dozen years earlier to the special end of minimising domestic labour and which he had always kept up to date with the latest devices in his lobby the spectacle of a vile outworn hand-brush at tea-time amounted to a scandal less than a fortnight previously he had purchased and presented to his wife a marvellous electric vacuum cleaner surpassing all former vacuum cleaners you simply attached this machine by a cord to the wall like a dog and waved it in mysterious passes over the floor like a fan and the house was clean he was as proud of this machine as though he had invented it instead of having merely bought it every day he inquired about its feats expecting enthusiastic replies as a sort of reward for his own keenness and be it said that he had had enthusiastic replies and now this obscene hand-brush as he carefully removed his hat and beautiful new melton overcoat which had the colour and the soft smoothness of a damson he animadverted upon the astounding negligence of women there were nelly his wife his mother the nurse the cook the maid five of them and in his mind they had all plotted together a conspiracy of carelessness to leave the inexcusable tool in his lobby for him to stumble over what was the use of accidentally procuring three hundred and forty-one pounds 
still no sign of nelly though he purposely made a noisy rattle with his ebon walking-stick then the maid burst out of the kitchen with a tray and the principal utensils for high tea thereon she had a guilty air the household was evidently late two steps at a time he rushed upstairs to the bathroom so as to be waiting in the dining-room at six precisely in order if possible to shame the household and fill it with remorse and unpleasantness yet ordinarily he was not a very prompt man nor did he delight in giving pain on the contrary he was apt to be casual blithe and agreeable the bathroom was his peculiar domain which he was always modernising and where his talent for the ingenious organisation of comfort and his utter indifference to aesthetic beauty had the fullest scope by universal consent admitted to be the finest bathroom in the five towns it typified the whole house he was disappointed on this occasion to see no untidy trace in it of the children's ablution some transgression of the supreme domestic law that the bathroom must always be free and immaculate when father wanted it would have suited his gathering humour as he washed his hands and cleansed his well-trimmed nails with a nail-brush that had cost five shillings and sixpence he glanced at himself in the mirror which he was splashing a stoutish broad-shouldered fair chubby man with a short bright beard and plenteous bright hair his necktie pleased him the elegance of his turned-back wristbands pleased him and he liked the rich down on his forearms he could not believe that he looked forty-three and a half and yet he had recently had an idea of shaving off his beard partly to defy time but partly also i must admit because a friend had suggested to him wildly perhaps that if he dispensed with a beard his hair might grow more sturdily yes there was one weak spot in the middle of the top of his head where the crop had of late disconcertingly thinned the hairdresser had informed him that the symptom would vanish under electric massage and that if he doubted the bona fides of hairdressers any doctor would testify to the value of electric massage but now edward henry machin strangely discouraged inexplicably robbed of the zest of existence decided that it was not worth while to shave off his beard nothing was worth while if he was forty-three and a half he was forty-three and a half to become bald was the common lot moreover beardless he would need the service of a barber every day and he was absolutely persuaded that not a barber worth the name could be found in the five towns he actually went to manchester thirty-six miles to get his hair cut the operation never cost him less than a sovereign and half a day's time and he honestly deemed himself to be a fellow of simple tastes such is the effect of the canker of luxury happily he could afford these simple tastes for although not rich in the modern significance of the term he paid income tax on some five thousand pounds a year without quite convincing the surveyor of taxes that he was an honest man he brushed the thick hair over the weak spot he turned down his wristbands he brushed the collar of his jacket and lastly his beard and he put on his jacket with a certain care for he was very neat and then reflectively twisting his moustache to military points he spied through the smaller window to see whether the new high hoarding of the football ground really did prevent a serious observer from descrying wayfarers as they breasted the hill from hanbridge it did not then he spied through the larger window upon the yard to see whether the wall of the new rooms which he had lately added to his house showed any further trace of damp and whether the new chauffeur was washing the new motor-car with all his heart the wall showed no further trace of damp and the new chauffeur's bent back seemed to symbolise an extreme conscientiousness then the clock on the landing struck six and he hurried off to put the household to open shame two nelly came into the dining-room two minutes after her husband 
as edward henry had laboriously counted these two minutes almost second by second on the dining-room clock he was very tired of waiting his secret annoyance was increased by the fact that nelly took off her white apron in the doorway and flung it hurriedly on the table tray which during the progress of meals was established outside the dining-room door he did not actually witness this operation of undressing because nelly was screened by the half-closed door but he was entirely aware of it he disliked it and he had always disliked it when nelly was at work either as a mother or as the owner of certain fine silver ornaments he rather enjoyed the wonderful white apron for it suited her temperament but as the head of a household with six thousand pounds a year at its disposal he objected to any hint of the thing at meals and to-night he objected to it altogether who could guess from the homeliness of their family life that he was in a position to spend a hundred pounds a week and still have enough income left over to pay the salary of a town clerk or so nobody could guess and he felt that people ought to be able to guess when he was young he would have esteemed an income of six thousand pounds a year as necessarily implicating feudal state valets castles yachts family solicitors racing stables county society dinner calls and a drawling london accent why should his wife wear an apron at all but the sad truth was that neither his wife nor his mother ever looked rich nor even endeavoured to look rich his mother would carry an eighty-pound sealskin as though she had picked it up at a jumble sale and his wife put such simplicity into the wearing of a hundred and eighty pound diamond ring that its expensiveness was generally quite wasted and yet while the logical male in him scathingly condemned this feminine defect of character his private soul was glad of it for he well knew that he would have been considerably irked by the complexities and grandeurs of high life but never would he have admitted this nelly's face as she sat down was not limpid he understood naught of it more than twenty years had passed since they had first met he and a wistful little creature at a historic town hall dance he could still see the wistful little creature in those placid and pure features in that buxom body but now there was a formidable capable and experienced woman there too impossible to credit that the wistful little creature was thirty-seven but she was indeed it was very doubtful if she would ever see thirty-eight again once he had had the most romantic feelings about her he could recall the slim flexibility of her waist the timorous melting invitation of her eyes and now such was human existence she sat up erect on her chair she did not apologise for being late she made no inquiry as to his neuralgia on the other hand she was not cross she was just neutral polite cheerful and apparently conscious of perfection he strongly desired to inform her of the exact time of day but his lips would not articulate the words maud she said with divine calm to the maid who bore in the baked york ham under its silver canopy you haven't taken away that brush that's in the passage another illustration of nelly's inability to live up to six thousand pounds a year she would always refer to the hall as the passage please em i did em replied maud now as conscious of perfection as her mistress he must have took it back again who's he demanded the master carlo sir upon which triumph maud retired edward henry was dashed nevertheless he quickly recovered his presence of mind and sought about for a justification of his previous verdict upon the negligence of five women it would have been easy enough to put the brush where the dog couldn't get at it he said but he said this strictly to himself he could not say it aloud nor could he say aloud the words neuralgia three hundred and forty one pounds any more than he could say late that he was in a peculiar mental condition is proved by the fact that he did not remark the absence of his mother 
until he was putting her share of baked ham onto a plate he thought this is a bit thick this is meaning the extreme lateness of his mother for the meal but his only audible remark was a somewhat impatient banging down of the hot plate in front of his mother's empty chair in answer to this banging nelly quietly began your mother he knew instantly then that nelly was disturbed about something or other mother-in-law and daughter-in-law lived together under one roof in perfect amity nay more they often formed powerful and unscrupulous leagues against him but whenever nelly was disturbed by no matter what she would say your mother instead of merely mother it was an extraordinary subtle silly and effective way of putting him in the wrong your mother is staying upstairs with robert robert was the eldest child aged eight oh breathed edward henry he might have inquired what the nurse was for he might have inquired how his mother meant to get her tea but he refrained adding simply what's up now and in retort to his wife's yaw he laid a faint emphasis on the word now to imply that those women were always inventing some fresh imaginary woe for the children carlo's bitten him in the calf said nelly tightening her lips this at any rate was not imaginary the kid was teasing him as usual i suppose he suggested that i don't know said nelly but i know we must get rid of that dog serious of course we must nelly insisted with an inadvertent heat which she immediately cooled i mean the bite well it's a bite right enough and you're thinking of hydrophobia death amid horrible agony and so on no i'm not she said stoutly trying to smile but he knew she was and he also knew that the bite was a trifle if it had been a good bite she would have made it enormous she would have hinted that the dog had left a chasm in the boy's flesh yes you are he continued to twit her encouraged by her attempt at a smile however the smile expired i suppose you won't deny that carlo's teeth may have been dirty he's always nosing in some filth or other she said challengingly in a measured tone of sagacity and there may be blood poisoning blood fiddlesticks exclaimed edward henry such a nonsensical and infantile rejoinder deserved no answer and it received none shortly afterwards maud entered and whispered that nelly was wanted upstairs as soon as his wife had gone edward henry rang the bell maud he said bring me the signal out of my left-hand overcoat pocket and he defiantly finished his meal at leisure with the news of the day propped up against the flower-pot which he had set before him instead of the dish of ham three later catching through the open door fragments of a conversation on the stairs which indicated that his mother was at last coming down for tea he sped like a threatened delinquent into the drawing-room he had no wish to encounter his mother though that woman usually said little the drawing-room after the bathroom was edward henry's favourite district in the home since he could not spend the whole of his time in the bathroom and he could not he wisely gave a special care to the drawing-room and he loved it as one always loves that upon which one has bestowed benefits he was proud of the drawing-room and he had the right to be the principal object in it at night was the electric chandelier which would have been adequate for a lighthouse edward henry's eyes were not what they used to be and the minor advertisements in the signal which constituted his sole evening perusals often lacked legibility edward henry sincerely believed in light and heat he was almost the only person in the five towns who did in the five towns people have fires in their grates not to warm the room but to make the room bright seemingly they used their pride to keep themselves warm at any rate whenever edward henry talked to them of radiators they would sternly reply that a radiator did not and could not brighten a room edward henry had made the great discovery that an efficient chandelier 
will brighten a room better even than a fire and he had gilded his radiator the notion of gilding the radiator was not his own he had seen a gilded radiator in the newest hotel at birmingham and had rejoiced as some peculiar souls rejoice when they meet a fine line in a new poem in concession to popular prejudice edward henry had fire grates in his house and fires therein during exceptionally frosty weather but this did not save him from being regarded in the five towns as in some ways a peculiar soul the effulgent source of dark heat was scientifically situated in front of the window and on ordinarily cold evenings edward henry and his wife and mother and an acquaintance if one happened to come in would gather round the radiator and play bridge or dummy whist the other phenomena of the drawing-room which particularly interested edward henry were the turkey carpet the four vast easy-chairs the sofa the imposing cigar cabinet and the mechanical piano player at one brief period he had hovered a good deal about the revolving bookcase containing the encyclopaedia to which his collection of books was limited but the frail passion for literature had not survived a struggle with the seductions of the mechanical piano player the walls of the room never drew his notice he had chosen some years before a patent washable kind of wallpaper which could be wiped over with a damp cloth and he had also chosen the pattern of the paper but it is a fact that he could spend hours in any room without even seeing the pattern of its paper in the same way his wife's cushions and little draperies and bows were invisible to him though he had searched for and duly obtained the perfect quality of swansdown which filled the cushions the one ornament of the walls which attracted him was a large and splendidly framed oil painting of a ruined castle in the midst of a sombre forest through which cows were strolling in the tower of the castle was a clock and this clock was a realistic timepiece whose fingers moved and told the hour two of the oriel windows of the castle were realistic holes in its masonry through one of them you could put a key to wind up the clock and through the other you could put a key to wind up a secret musical box which played sixteen different tunes he had brought this handsome relic of the victorian era not less artistic despite your scorn the many devices for satisfying the higher instincts of the present day at an auction sale in the strand london but it too had been supplanted in his esteem by the mechanical piano player he now selected an example of the most expensive cigar in the cigar cabinet and lighted it as only a connoisseur can light a cigar lovingly he blew out the match lingeringly with regret and dropped it and the cigar's red collar with care into a large copper bowl on the centre table instead of flinging it against the japanese umbrella in the fireplace a grave disadvantage of radiators is that you cannot throw odds and ends into them he chose the most expensive cigar because he wanted comfort and peace the ham was not digesting very well then he sat down and applied himself to the property advertisements in the signal a form of sensational serial which usually enthralled him but not to-night he allowed the paper to lapse on the floor and then rose impatiently rearranged the thick dark blue curtains behind the radiator and finally yielded to the silent call of the mechanical piano player he quite knew that to dally with the piano player while smoking a high-class cigar was to insult the cigar but he did not care he tilted the cigar upwards from an extreme corner of his mouth and through the celestial smoke gazed at the titles of the new music rolls which had been delivered that day and which were ranged on the top of the piano itself and while he did so he was thinking why in thunder didn't the little thing come and tell me at once about that kid and his dog bite i wonder why she didn't she seemed only to mention it by accident i wonder why she didn't bounce into the bathroom and tell me at once but it was untrue that he sought vainly for an answer to this riddle he was aware of the answer he even kept saying over the answer to himself 
she's made up her mind i've been teasing her a bit too much lately about those kids and their precious illnesses and she's doing the dignified that's what she's doing she's doing the dignified of course instantly after his tea he ought to have gone upstairs to inspect the wounded victim of dogs the victim was his own child and its mother was his wife he knew that he ought to have gone upstairs long since he knew that he ought to go now and the sooner the better but somehow he could not go he could not bring himself to go in the minor and major crises of married life there are not two partners but four each partner has a dual personality each partner is indeed two different persons and one of these fights against the other with the common result of a fatal inaction the wickeder of the opposing persons in edward henry getting the upper hand of the more virtuous sniggered dirty teeth indeed blood poisoning indeed why not rabies while she's about it i guarantee she's dreaming of coffins and mourning coaches already scanning nonchalantly the titles of the music rolls he suddenly saw funeral march chopin she shall have it he said affixing the roll to the mechanism and added whatever it is for he was not acquainted with the funeral march from chopin's pianoforte sonata his musical education had in truth begun only a year earlier with the advertisement of the pianisto mechanical player he was a judge of advertisements and the pianisto literature pleased him in a high degree he justifiably reckoned that he could distinguish between honest and dishonest advertising he made a deep study of the question of mechanical players and deliberately came to the conclusion that the pianisto was the best it was also the most costly but one of the conveniences of having six thousand pounds a year is that you need not deny yourself the best mechanical player because it happens to be the most costly he bought a pianisto and incidentally he bought a superb grand piano and exiled the old cottage piano to the nursery the pianisto was the best partly because like the vacuum cleaner it could be operated by electricity and partly because by means of certain curved lines on the unrolling paper and of certain gunmetal levers and clutches it enabled the operator to put his secret ardent soul into the music assuredly it had given edward henry a taste for music the whole world of musical compositions was his to conquer and he conquered it at the rate of about two great masters a month from handel to richard strauss even from palestrina to debussy the achievements of genius lay at his mercy he criticised them with a freedom that was entirely unprejudiced by tradition beethoven was no more to him than arthur sullivan indeed was rather less the works of his choice were the tannhuiser overture a potpourri of verdi's aida chopin's study in thirds which ravished him and a selection from the merry widow which also ravished him so that on the whole it may be said that he had a very good natural taste he at once liked chopin's funeral march he entered profoundly into the spirit of it with the gun metal levers he produced in a marvellous fashion the long tragic roll of the drums and by the manipulation of a clutch he distilled into the chant at the graveside a melancholy sweetness that rent the heart the later crescendi were overwhelming and as he played there with the bright blaze of the chandelier on his fair hair and beard and the blue cigar smoke in his nostrils and the effluence of the gilded radiator behind him and the intimacy of the drawn window curtains and the closed and curtained door folding him in from the world and the agony of the music grieving his artistic soul to the core as he played there he grew gradually happier and happier and the zest of existence seemed to return it was not only that he felt the elemental unfathomable satisfaction of a male who is sheltered in solitude from a pack of women that have got on his nerves there was also the more piquant assurance that he was behaving in a very sprightly manner 
how long was it since he had accomplished anything worthy of his ancient reputation as a card as the card of the five towns he could not say but now he knew that he was being a card again the whole town would smile and forgive and admire if it learnt that nelly invaded the room she had resumed the affray denry she reproached him in an uncontrolled voice i'm ashamed of you i really am she was no longer doing the dignified the mask was off and the unmistakable lineaments of the outraged mother appeared that she should address him as denry proved the intensity of her agitation years ago when he had been made an alderman his wife and his mother had decided that denry was no longer a suitable name for him and had abandoned it in favour of edward henry he ceased playing why he protested with a ridiculous air of innocence i'm only playing chopin can't i play chopin he was rather surprised and impressed that she had recognised the piece for what it was but of course she did as a fact know something about music he remembered though she never touched the pianisto i think it's a pity you can't choose some other evening for your funeral marches she exclaimed if that's it said edward henry like lightning why did you stick me out you weren't afraid of hydrophobia i'll thank you to come upstairs she replied with warmth oh all right my dear all right he cooed and they went upstairs in a rather solemn procession four nelly led the way to the chamber known as maisie's room where the youngest of the machins was wont to sleep in charge of the nurse who under the supervision of the mother of all three had dominion over robert ralph and their little sister the first thing that edward henry noticed was the screen which shut off one of the beds the unfurling of the fourfold screen was always a sure sign that nelly was taking an infantile illness seriously it was an indication to edward henry of the importance of the dog bite in nelly's esteem when all the chicks of the brood happened to be simultaneously sound the screen reposed inconspicuous at an angle against a wall behind the door but when pestilence was abroad the screen travelled from one room to another in the wake of it and spreading wide took part in the battle of life and death in an angle of the screen on the side of it away from the bed and near the fire in times of stress nelly would not rely on radiators sat old mrs machin knitting she was a thin bony woman of sixty-nine years and as hard and imperishable as teak so far as her son knew she had only had two illnesses in her life the first was an attack of influenza and the second was an attack of acute rheumatism which had incapacitated her for several weeks edward henry and nelly had taken advantage of her helplessness then to force her to give up her barbaric cottage in broom street and share permanently the splendid comfort of their home she existed in their home like a philosophic prisoner of war at the court of conquerors behaving faultlessly behaving magnanimously in the melancholy grandeur of her fall but never renouncing her soul's secret independence nor permitting herself to forget that she was on foreign ground when edward henry looked at those yellow and seasoned fingers which by hard manual labour had kept herself and him in the young days of his humble obscurity and which during sixty years had not been idle for more than six weeks in all he grew almost apologetic for his wealth they reminded him of the day when his total resources were five pounds won in a wager and of the day when he drove proudly about behind a mule collecting other people's rents and of the glittering day when he burst in on her from landudno with over a thousand gold sovereigns in a hat-box product of his first great picturesque coup imagining himself to be an english jay gould she had not blenched even then she had not blenched since and she would never blench in spite of his gorgeous position and his unique reputation in spite of her well-concealed but notorious pride in him 
he still went in fear of that ageless woman whose undaunted eye always told him that he was still the lad denry and her inferior in moral force the curve of her thin lips seemed ever to be warning him that with her pretensions were quite useless and that she saw through him and through him to the innermost grottoes of, of his poor human depravity he caught her eye guiltily behold the alderman she murmured with grimness that was all but the three words took thirty years off his back snatched the half-crown cigar out of his hand and reduced him again to the raw hungry boy of broom street and he knew that he had sinned gravely in not coming upstairs very much earlier is that you father called the high voice of robert from the back of the screen he had to admit to his son that it was he the infant lay on his back in maisie's bed while his mother sat lightly on the edge of nurse's bed near by well you're a nice chap said edward henry avoiding nelly's glance but trying to face his son as one innocent man may face another and not perfectly succeeding he never could feel like a real father somehow my temperature's above normal announced robert proudly and then added with regret but not much there was the clinical thermometer instrument which edward henry despised and detested as being an inciter of illnesses in a glass of water on the table between the two beds father robert began again well robert said edward henry cheerfully he was glad that the child was in one of his rare loquacious moods because the chatter not only proved that the dog had done no serious damage it also eased the silent strain between himself and nelly why did you play the funeral march father asked robert and the question fell into the tranquillity of the room rather like a bomb that had not quite decided whether or not to burst for the second time that evening edward henry was dashed have you been meddling with my music rolls no father i only read the labels this child simply read everything how did you know i was playing a funeral march edward henry demanded oh i didn't tell him nelly put in excusing herself before she was accused she smiled benignly as an angel woman capable of forgiving all but there were moments when edward henry hated moral superiority and christian meekness in a wife moreover nelly somewhat spoiled her own effect by adding with an artificial continuation of a smile you needn't look at me edward henry considered the remark otiose though he had indeed ventured to look at her he had not looked at her in the manner which she implied it made a noise like funerals and things robert explained well it seems to me you have been playing a funeral march said edward henry to the child he thought this rather funny rather worthy of himself but the child answered with ruthless gravity and a touch of disdain for he was a disdainful child without bowels i don't know what you mean father the curve of his lips he had his grandmother's lips appeared to say i wish you wouldn't try to be silly father however youth forgets very quickly and the next instant robert was beginning once more father well robert by mutual agreement of the parents the child was never addressed as bob or bobby or by any other diminutive in their practical opinion a child's name was his name and ought not to be mauled or dismembered on the pretext of fondness similarly the child had not been baptized after his father or after any male member of either the machin or the cotterell family why should family names be perpetuated merely because they were family names a natural human reaction this against the excessive sentimentalism of the victorian era what does stamped out mean robert inquired now robert among other activities busied himself in the collection of postage stamps and in consequence his father's mind under the impulse of the question ran immediately to postage stamps stamped out said edward henry with the air of omniscience that a father is bound to assume 
postage stamps are stamped out by a machine you see robert's scorn of this explanation was manifest well edward henry piqued made another attempt you stamp a fire out with your feet and he stamped illustratively on the floor after all the child was only eight i knew all that before said robert coldly you don't understand what makes you ask dear let us show father your leg nelly's voice was soothing yes robert murmured staring reflectively at the ceiling that's it it says in the encyclopedia that hydrophobia is stamped out in this country by mr long's muzzling order who is mr long a second bomb had fallen on exactly the same spot as the first and the two exploded simultaneously and the explosion was none the less terrible because it was silent and invisible the tidy domestic chamber was strewn in a moment with an awful mass of wounded susceptibilities beyond the screen the nick-nick of grandmother's steel needles stopped and started again it was characteristic of her temperament that she should recover before the younger generations could recover edward henry as befitted his sex regained his nerve a little earlier than nelly i told you never to touch my encyclopedia said he sternly robert had twice been caught on his stomach on the floor with a vast volume open under his chin and his studies had been traced by vile thumb marks i know said robert whenever anybody gave that child a piece of unsolicited information he almost invariably replied i know but hydrophobia cried nelly how did you know about hydrophobia we had it in spellings last week robert explained the deuce you did muttered edward henry the one bright fact of the many-sided and gloomy crisis was the obvious truth that robert was the most extraordinary child that ever lived but when on earth did you get at the encyclopedia robert his mother exclaimed completely at a loss it was before you came in from hillport the wondrous infant answered after my leg had stopped hurting me a bit but when i came in nurse said it had only just happened shows how much she knew said robert with contempt does your leg hurt you now edward henry inquired a bit that's why i can't go to sleep of course well let's have a look at it edward henry attempted jollity mother's wrapped it all up in boracic wool the bedclothes were drawn down and the leg gradually revealed and the sight of the little soft leg so fragile and defenceless really did touch edward henry it made him feel more like an authentic father than he had felt for a long time and the sight of the red wound hurt him still it was a beautifully clean wound and it was not a large wound it's a clean wound he observed judiciously in spite of himself he could not keep a certain flippant harsh quality out of his tone well i've naturally washed it with carbolic nelly returned sharply he logically resented this sharpness of course he was bitten through his stocking of course said nelly re-enveloping the wound hastily as though edward henry was not worthy to regard it well then by the time they got through the stocking the animal's teeth couldn't be dirty everyone knows that nelly shut her lips were you teasing carlo edward henry demanded curtly of his son i don't know whenever anybody asked that child for a piece of information he almost invariably replied i don't know how you don't know you must know whether you were teasing the dog or not edward henry was nettled the renewed spectacle of his own wound had predisposed robert to feel a great and tearful sympathy for himself his mouth now began to take strange shapes and to increase magically in area and beads appeared in the corners of his large eyes i, I, I was only measuring his tail by his hind leg he blubbered and then sobbed edward henry did his best to save his dignity come come he reasoned less menacingly 
boys who can read encyclopedias mustn't be crybabies you'd no business measuring carlo's tail by his hind leg you ought to remember that that dog's older than you and this remark too he thought rather funny but apparently he was alone in his opinion now he felt something against his calf and it was carlo's nose carlo was a large very shaggy and unkempt northern terrier but owing to vagueness of his principal points due doubtless to a vagueness in his immediate ancestry it was impossible to decide whether he had come from the north or the south side of the tweed this ageing friend of edward henry's surmising that something unusual was afoot in his house and having entirely forgotten the trifling episode of the bite had unobtrusively come to make enquiries poor old boy said edward henry stooping to pat the dog did they try to measure his tail with his hind leg the gesture was partly instinctive for he loved carlo but it also had its origin in sheer nervousness in sheer ignorance of what was the best thing to do however he was at once aware that he had done the worst thing had not nelly announced that the dog must be got rid of and here he was fondly caressing the bloodthirsty dog with a hysterical movement of the lower part of her leg nelly pushed violently against the dog she did not kick but she nearly kicked and carlo faintly howling a protest fled edward henry was hurt he escaped from between the beds and from that close enervating domestic atmosphere where he was misunderstood by women and disdained by infants he wanted fresh air he wanted bars whiskies billiard rooms and the society of masculine men about town the whole of his own world was against him as he passed by his knitting mother she ignored him and moved not she had a great gift of holding aloof from conjugal complications on the landing he decided that he would go out at once into the major world Halfway down the stairs he saw his overcoat on the hall stand beckoning to him and offering release then he heard the bedroom door and his wife's footsteps edward henry well he stopped and looked up inimically at her face which overhung the banisters it was the face of a woman outraged in her most profound feelings but amazingly determined to be sweet what do you think of it what do i think of what the wound yes why it's simply nothing nothing at all you know how that kid always heals up quickly you won't be able to find the wound in a day or two don't you think it ought to be cauterized at once he moved downwards no i don't i've been bitten three times in my life by dogs and i was never cauterized well i do think it ought to be cauterized she raised her voice slightly as he retreated from her and i shall be glad if you'll call in at dr stirling's and ask him to come round he made no reply but put on his overcoat and his hat and took his stick glancing up the stairs he saw nelly was now standing at the head of them under the electric light there and watching him he knew that she thought he was cravenly obeying her command she could have no idea that before she spoke to him he had already decided to put on his overcoat and hat and take his stick and go forth into the major world however that was no affair of his he hesitated a second then the nurse appeared out of the kitchen with a squalling maisie in her arms and ran upstairs why maisie was squalling and why she should have been in the kitchen at such an hour instead of in bed he could not guess but he could guess that if he remained one second longer in that exasperating minor world he would begin to smash furniture and so he quitted it five it was raining slightly but he dared not return to the house for his umbrella in the haze and wet of the shivering october night the clock of bleakridge church glowed like a fiery disc suspended in the sky and mysteriously hanging there without visible means of support it seemed to him 
to somehow symbolise the enigma of the universe and intensify his inward gloom never before had he had such feelings to such a degree it is scarcely an exaggeration to say that never before had the enigma of the universe occurred to him the side gates clicked as he stood hesitant under the shelter of the wall and a figure emerged from his domain it was belfield the new chauffeur going across to his home in the little square in front of the church belfield touched his cap with an eager and willing hand as new chauffeurs will want the car sir setting in for a wet night no thanks it was a lie he did want the car he wanted the car so that he might ride away into a new and more interesting world or at any rate into hambridge centre of the pleasures the wickedness and the commerce of the five towns but he dared not have the car he dared not have his own car he must slip off noiseless and unassuming even to go to dr stirling's he dared not have the car besides he could have walked down the hill to dr stirling's in three minutes not that he had the least intention of going to dr stirling's no his wife imagined that he was going but she was mistaken within an hour when dr stirling had failed to arrive she would doubtless telephone and get her dr stirling not however with edward henry's assistance he reviewed his conduct throughout the evening in what particular had it been sinful in no particular true the accident to the boy was a misfortune but had he not borne that misfortune lightly minimised it and endeavoured to teach others to bear it lightly his blithe humour ought surely to have been an example to nelly and as for the episode of the funeral march on the pianisto really the tiresome little thing ought to have better appreciated his whimsical drollery but nelly was altered he was altered everything was altered he remembered the ecstasy of their excursion to switzerland he remembered the rapture with which on their honeymoon he had clasped a new opal bracelet on her exciting arm he could not possibly have such sensations now what was the meaning of life was life worth living the fact was he was growing old useless to pretend to himself that it was not so both he and she were growing old only she seemed to be placidly content and he was not content and more and more the domestic atmosphere and the atmosphere of the district fretted and even annoyed him to-night's affair was not unique but it was a culmination he gazed pessimistically north and south along the slimy expanse of trafalgar road which sank northwards in the direction of dr stirling's and southwards in the direction of joyous hanbridge he loathed and despised trafalgar road what was the use of making three hundred and forty one pounds by a shrewd speculation none he could not employ three hundred and forty one pounds to increase his happiness money had become futile for him astounding thought he desired no more of it he had a considerable income from investments and also at least four thousand a year from the five towns universal thrift club that wonderful but unpretentious organization which now embraced every corner of the five towns that gorgeous invention for profitably taking care of the pennies of the working classes that excellent device his own for selling the working classes every kind of goods at credit prices after having received part of the money in advance i want a change he said to himself and threw away his cigar after all the bitterest thought in his heart was perhaps that on that evening he had tried to be a card and for the first time in his brilliant career as a card had failed he mr henry machin who had been the youngest mayor of bursley years and years ago he the recognised amuser of the five towns he one of the greatest characters that the five towns had ever produced had failed of an effect he slipped out onto the pavement and saw under the gas lamp on the new hoarding of the football ground a poster intimating that during that particular week there was a gigantic attraction at the empire music hall at hambridge 
according to the posters there was a gigantic attraction every week at the empire but edward henry happened to know that this week the attraction was indeed somewhat out of the common and to-night was friday the fashionable night for the bloods and the modishness of the five towns he looked at the church clock and then at his watch he would be in time for the second house which started at nine o'clock at the same moment an electric tramcar came thundering up out of bursley he boarded it and was saluted by the conductor remaining on the platform he lit a cigarette and tried to feel cheerful but he could not conquer his depression yes he thought what i want is change and a lot of it too End of chapter one Chapter Two of the Old Adam by Arnold Bennett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Banknote One Alderman Machin had to stand at the back and somewhat towards the side of that part of the auditorium known as the Grand Circle at the Empire Music Hall, Hambridge. The attendants at the entrance and in the lounge, where the salutation, welcome, shone in electricity over a large cupid-surrounded mirror, had compassionately and yet exultingly told him there was not a seat left in the house. He had shared their exultation. He had said to himself, full of honest pride in the five towns, This music hall, admitted by the press to be one of the finest in the provinces, holds over two thousand five hundred people, and yet we can fill it to overflowing twice every night and only a few years ago there wasn't a decent music hall in the entire district the word progress flitted through his head it was not strictly true that the empire was or could be filled to overflowing twice every night but it was true that at that particular moment not a seat was unsold and the aspect of a crowded auditorium is apt to give an optimistic quality to broad generalizations alderman machin began instinctively to calculate the amount of money in the house and to wonder whether there would be a chance for a second music hall in the dissipated town of hambridge he also wondered why the idea of a second music hall in hambridge had never occurred to him before the grand circle was so called because it was grand its plush fauteuil cost a shilling no mean price for a community where seven pounds of potatoes can be bought for sixpence and the view of the stage therefrom was perfect but the alderman's view was far from perfect since he had to peer as best he could between and above the shoulders of several men each apparently but not really taller than himself by constant slight movements to comply with the movements of the rampart of shoulders he could discern fragments of various advertisements of soap motor-cars whisky shirts perfume pills bricks and tea for the drop curtain was down and curiously he felt obliged to keep his eyes on the drop curtain and across the long intervening vista of hats and heads and smoke to explore its most difficult corners again and again lest when it went up he might not be in proper practice for seeing what was behind it nevertheless despite the marked inconveniences of his situation he felt brighter he felt almost happy in this dense atmosphere of success he even found a certain peculiar and perverse satisfaction in the fact that he had as yet been recognised by nobody once or twice the owners of shoulders had turned and deliberately glared at the worrying fellow who had the impudence to be all the time peeping over them and between them they had not distinguished the fellow from any ordinary fellow could they have known that he was the famous alderman edward henry machin founder and sole proprietor of the thrift club into which their wives were probably paying so much a week they would most assuredly have glared to another tune and they would have said with pride afterwards that chap machin of bursley was standing behind me at the empire to-night and though machin is amongst the commonest names in the five towns all would have known that the great and admired denry was meant it was astonishing that a personage so notorious should not have been instantly spotted 
in such a resort as the empire more proof that the five towns was a vast and seething concentration of cities and no longer a mere district where everybody knew everybody the curtain rose and as it did so a thunderous crashing applause of greeting broke forth applause that thrilled and impressed and inspired applause that made every individual in the place feel right glad that he was there for the curtain had risen on the gigantic attraction which many members of the audience were about to see for the fifth time that week in fact it was rumoured that certain men of fashion whose habit was to refuse themselves nothing had attended every performance of the gigantic attraction since the second house on monday the scene represented a restaurant of quiet aspect into which entered a waiter bearing a pile of plates some two feet high the waiter being intoxicated the tower of plates leaned this way and that as he staggered about and the whole house really did hold its breath in the simultaneous hope and fear of an enormous resounding smash then entered a second intoxicated waiter also bearing a pile of plates some two feet high and the risk of destruction was thus more than doubled it was quadrupled for each waiter in addition to the risks of his own inebriety was now subject to the dreadful peril of colliding with the other however there was no catastrophe then arrived two customers one in a dress suit and an eyeglass and the other in a large violet hat a diamond necklace and a yellow satin skirt the which customers seemingly well used to the sight of drunken waiters tottering to and fro with towers of plates sat down at a table and waited calmly for attention the popular audience with that quick mental grasp for which popular audiences are so renowned soon perceived that the table was in close proximity to a lofty sideboard and that on either hand of the sideboard were two chairs upon which the two waiters were trying to climb in order to deposit their plates on the topmost shelf of the sideboard the waiters successfully mounted the chairs and successfully lifted their towers of plates to within half an inch of the desired shelf and then the chairs began to show signs of insecurity by this time the audience was stimulated to an ecstasy of expectation whose painfulness was only equalled by its extreme delectability the sole unmoved persons in the building were the customers awaiting attention at the restaurant table one tower was safely lodged on the shelf but was it it was not yes no it's curved it's straightened it's curved again the excitement was as keen as that of watching a drowning man attempt to reach the shore it was simply excruciating it could not be borne any longer and when it could not be borne any longer the tower sprawled irrevocably and seven dozen plates fell in a cascade on the violet hat and so with an inconceivable clatter to the floor almost at the same moment the being in the dress suit and the eyeglass becoming aware of the phenomena slightly unusual even in a restaurant dropped his eyeglass turned round to the sideboard and received the other waiter's seven dozen plates in the face and on the crown of his head no such effect had ever been seen in the five towns and the felicity of the audience succeeded all previous felicities the audience yelled roared shrieked gasped trembled and punched itself in a furious passion of pleasure they make plates in the five towns they live by making plates they understand plates in the five towns a man will carry not seven but twenty-seven dozen plates on a swaying plank for eight hours a day up steps and down steps and in doorways and out of doorways and not break one plate in seven years judge therefore the simple but terrific satisfaction of a five towns audience in the hugeness of the calamity moreover every plate smashed means a demand for a new plate and increased prosperity for the five towns the grateful crowd in the auditorium of the empire would have covered the stage with wreaths if it had known that wreaths were used for other occasions than funerals which it did not know fresh complications instantly ensued which cruelly cut short the agreeable exercise of uncontrolled laughter it was obvious that one of the waiters was about to fall and in the enforced tranquillity of a new dread 
every dyspeptic person in the house was deliciously conscious of a sudden freedom from indigestion due to the agreeable exercise of uncontrolled laughter and wished fervently that he could laugh like that after every meal the waiter fell he fell through the large violet hat and disappeared beneath the surface of a sea of crockery the other waiter fell too but the sea was not deep enough to drown a couple of them then the customers recovering themselves decided that they must not be outclassed in this competition of havoc and they overthrew the table and everything on it and all the other tables and everything on all the other tables the audience was now a field of artillery which nothing could silence the waiters arose and opening the sideboard disclosed many hundreds of unsuspected plates of all kinds ripe for smashing niagaras of plates surged on to the stage all four performers revelled and wallowed in smashed plates new supplies of plates were constantly being produced from strange concealments and finally the tables and chairs were broken to pieces and each object on the walls was torn down and flung in bits on to the gorgeous general debris to the top of which clambered the violet hat necklace and yellow petticoat brandishing one single little plate whose life had been miraculously spared shrieks of joy in that little plate played over the din like lightning in a thunderstorm and the curtain fell it was rung up fifteen times and fifteen times the quartet of artists breathless bowed in acknowledgment of the frenzied and boisterous testimony to their unique talents no singer no tragedian no comedian no wit could have had such a triumph could have given such intense pleasure and yet none of the four had spoken a word such is genius at the end of the fifteenth call the stage manager came before the curtain and guaranteed that two thousand four hundred plates had been broken the lights went up strong men were seen to be wiping tears from their eyes complete strangers were seen addressing each other in the manner of old friends such is art well that was worth a bob that was muttered edward henry to himself and it was edward henry had not escaped the general fate nobody being present could have escaped it he was enchanted he had utterly forgotten every care good evening mr machin said a voice at his side not only he turned but nearly everyone in the vicinity turned the voice was the voice of the stout and splendid managing director of the empire and it sounded with the ring of authority above the rising tinkle of the bar behind the grand circle oh how do you do mr dakins edward henry held out a cordial hand for even the greatest men are pleased to be greeted in a place of entertainment by the managing director thereof further his identity was now recognised haven't you seen those gentlemen in that box beckoning to you said mr dakins proudly deprecating complimentary remarks on the show which box mr dakins hand indicated the stage box and henry looking saw three men one unknown to him the second robert brindley the architect of bursley and the third dr stirling instantly his conscience leapt up within him he thought of rabies yes sobered in the fraction of a second he thought of rabies supposing that after all in spite of mr long's muzzling order as cited by his infant son an odd case of rabies should have lingered in the british isles and supposing that carlo had been infected not impossible was it providential that dr stirling was in the auditorium you know two of them said mr dakins yes well the third's a mr bryany he's manager to mr seven sachs mr dakins tone was respectful and who's mr seven sachs asked edward henry absently it was a stupid question he was impressively informed that mr seven sachs was the arch famous american actor playwright now nearing the end of a provincial tour which had surpassed all records of provincial tours and that he would be at the theatre royal hambridge next week edward henry then remembered that the hoardings had been full of mr seven sachs for some time past they keep on making signs to you said mr dakins referring to the occupants of the stage box edward henry waved a reply to the box 
here i'll take you there the shortest way said mr dakins two welcome to stirling's box machin robert brindley greeted the alderman with an almost imperceptible wink edward henry had encountered this wink once or twice before he could not decide precisely what it meant it was apt to make him reflective he did not dislike robert brindley his habit was not to dislike people he admitted brindley to be a clever architect though he objected to the modern style of the fronts of his houses and schools but he did take exception to the man's attitude towards the five towns of which by the way brindley was just as much a native as himself brindley seemed to live in the five towns like a highly cultured stranger in a savage land and to derive rather too much sardonic amusement from the spectacle of existence therein brindley was a very special crony of stirling's and had influenced stirling but stirling was too clever to submit unduly to the influence besides stirling was not a native he was only a scotchman and edward henry considered that what stirling thought of the district did not matter other details about brindley which edward henry deprecated were his necktie which for edward henry's taste was too flowing his scorn of the pianisto despite the man's tremendous interest in music and his incipient madness on the subject of books a madness shared by stirling brindley and the doctor were for ever chattering about books and buying them so that on the whole dr stirling's box was not a place where edward henry felt entirely at home nevertheless the two men having presented mr bryany did their best each in his own way to make him feel at home take this chair machin said stirling indicating a chair at the front oh i can't take the front chair edward henry protested of course you can my dear machin said brindley sharply the front chair in a stage box is the one proper seat in the house for you do as your doctor prescribes and edward henry accordingly sat down at the front with mr bryany by his side and the other two sat behind but edward henry was not quite comfortable he faintly resented that speech of brindley's and yet he did feel that what brindley had said was true and he was indeed glad to be in the front chair of a brilliant stage box on the grand tier instead of being packed away in the nethermost twilight of the grand circle he wondered how brindley and stirling had managed to distinguish his face among the confusion of faces in that distant obscurity he edward henry had failed to notice them even in the prominence of their box but that they had distinguished him showed how familiar and striking a figure he was he wondered too why they should have invited him to hobnob with them he was not of their set indeed like many very eminent men he was not to any degree in anybody's set of one thing he was sure because he had read it on the self-conscious faces of all three of them namely that they had been discussing him possibly he had been brought up for mr bryany's inspection as a major lion and character of the district well he did not mind that nay he enjoyed that he could feel mr bryany covertly looking him over and he thought look my boy i make no charge he smiled and nodded to one or two people who with pride saluted him from the stalls it was meet that he should be visible there on that friday night a full house he observed to break the rather awkward silence of the box as he glanced round at the magnificent smoke-veiled pageant of the aristocracy and the democracy of the five towns crowded together tier above gilded tier up to the dim roof where ragged lads and maids giggled and flirted while waiting for the broken plates to be cleared away and the moving pictures to begin you may say it agreed mr bryany who spoke with a very slight american accent dakins positively hadn't a seat to offer me i happen to have the evening free it isn't often i do have a free evening and so i thought i'd pop in here but if dakins hadn't introduced me to these gentlemen my seat would have had to be a standing one so that's how they got to know him is it thought edward henry and then there was another short silence here you've been doing something striking in rubbish shares machin said brindley at length astonishing how these things got abroad oh very little very little edward henry laughed modestly too late to do much in another fortnight the bottom will be all out of the rubber market of course i'm an englishman mr bryany began why of course 
Edward Henry interrupted him. Here, here, Alderman, why, of course, said Brindley approvingly, and Stirling's rich laugh was heard. Only it does just happen, Brindley added, that Mr. Bryany did us the honour to be born in the district. Yes, Longshaw, Mr. Bryany admitted, half proud and half apologetic, which I left at the end of two. Oh, Longshaw, murmured Edward Henry, with a peculiar inflection, which had a distinct meaning for at least two of his auditors. Longshaw is at the opposite end of the five towns from Bursley, and the majority of the inhabitants of Bursley have never been to Longshaw in their lives, have only heard of it, as they hear of Chicago or Bangkok. Edward Henry had often been to Longshaw, but, like every visitor from Bursley, he instinctively regarded it as a foolish and unnecessary place. "'As I was saying,' resumed Mr. Bryany, quite unintimidated, "'I'm an Englishman, but I've lived eighteen years in America, and it seems to me the bottom will soon be knocked out of pretty nearly all the markets in England. Look at the five towns.' "'No, don't, Mr. Bryany,' said Brindley. "'Don't go to extremes.' "'Personally, I don't mind looking at the five towns,' said Edward Henry. "'What of it?' "'Well, did you ever see such people for looking twice at a five-pound note?' Edward Henry most certainly did not like this aspersion on his native district. He glanced in silence at Mr. Bryany's brassy and yet simple face, and did not like the face either. And Mr. Bryany, beautifully unaware that he had failed in tact, continued, "'The Five Towns is the most English place I've ever seen, believe me. Of course, it has its good points, and England has her good points.' but there's no money stirring there's no field for speculation on the spot and as for outside investment no englishman will touch anything that really is good he emphasized the last three words what do you do yourself mr bryany inquired dr stirling what do i do with my little bit cried mr bryany oh i know what to do with my little bit i can get ten per cent in seattle and twelve to fifteen in calgary on my little bit and security just as good as English railway stock, and better. The theatre was darkened, and the cinematograph began its reckless twinkling. Mr. Bryany went on offering to Edward Henry, in a suitably lowered voice, his views on the great questions of investment and speculation, and Edward Henry made cautious replies. And even when there is a good thing going at home, Mr. Bryany said in a wounded tone, what Englishman had look at it? I would said edward henry with a blandness that was only skin deep for all the time he was cogitating the question whether the presence of dr stirling in the audience ought or ought not to be regarded as providential now i've got the option on a little affair in london said mr bryany while edward henry glanced quickly at him in the darkness can i get anybody to go into it i can't what sort of a little affair building a theatre in the west end even a less impassive man than Edward Henry would have started at the coincidence of this remark, and Edward Henry started. Twenty minutes ago he had been idly dreaming of theatrical speculation, and now he could almost see theatrical speculation shimmering before him in the pale shifting rays of the cinematograph that cut through the gloom of the mysterious auditorium. Oh, and in this new interest he forgot the enigma of the ways of providence. "'Of course, you know I'm in the business,' said Mr. Bryany. "'I'm Seven Sachs's manager.' It was as if he owned and operated Mr. Seven Sachs. "'So I heard,' said Mr. Edward Henry, and then remarked with mischievous cordiality, "'And I suppose these chaps told you I was the sort of man you were after, and you got them to ask me in, eh, Mr. Bryany?' Mr. Bryany gave an uneasy laugh, but seemed to find naught to say. "'Well, what is your little affair?' Edward Henry encouraged him. "'Oh, I can't tell you now,' said Mr. Bryany. "'It would take too long. The thing has to be explained. "'Well, what about tomorrow? "'I have to leave for London by the first train in the morning. "'Well, some other time. "'After tomorrow will be too late. "'Well, what about tonight? "'The fact is, I've half promised to go with Dr. Stirling "'to some club or other after the show. "'Otherwise we might have had a quiet confidential chat "'in my rooms over the Turk's head. "'I never dreamt.' "'Mr. Bryany was now as melancholy as a greedy lad who regards rich fruit at arm's length through a plate-glass window, and he had ceased to be patronising. "'I'll soon get rid of Stirling for you,' said Edward Henry, turning instantly towards the doctor. 
the ways of providence had been made plain to edward henry i say doc but the doctor and brindley were in conversation with another man at the open door of the box what is it said stirling i've come to fetch you you want it at my place well you're a caution said stirling why am i a caution edward henry smoothly protested i didn't tell you before because i didn't want to spoil your fun stirling's mien was not happy did they tell you i was here he asked you'd almost think so wouldn't you said edward henry in a playful enigmatic tone after all he decided privately his wife was right it was better that stirling should see the infant and there was also this natural human thought in his mind he objected to the doctor giving an entire evening to diversions away from home he considered that a doctor when not on a round of visits ought to be for ever in his consulting room ready for a sudden call of emergency it was monstrous that stirling should have proposed after an escapade at the music hall to spend further hours with chance acquaintances in vague clubs half the town might fall sick and die while the doctor was vainly amusing himself thus the righteous layman in edward henry what's the matter asked stirling my eldest's been rather badly bitten by a dog and the missus wants it cauterized really well you bet she does where's the bite in the calf the other man at the door having departed robert brindley abruptly joined the conversation at this point i suppose you've heard of that case of hydrophobia at bleakridge said brindley edward henry's heart jumped no i haven't he said anxiously what is it he gazed at the white blur of brindley's face in the darkened box and he could hear the rapid clicking of the cinematograph behind him didn't you see it in the signal no neither did i said brindley at the same moment the moving pictures came to an end the theatre was filled with light and the band began to play god save the king brindley and stirling were laughing and indeed brindley had scored this time over the unparalleled card of the five towns i make you a present of that said edward henry but my wife's most precious infant has to be cauterized doctor he added firmly got your car here stirling questioned no have you no well there's a tram i'll follow you later i've some business round this way persuade my wife not to worry will you and when a discontented dr stirling had made his excuses and adieu to mr bryany and robert brindley had decided that he could not leave his crony to travel by tramcar alone and the two men had gone then edward henry turned to mr bryany that's how i get rid of the doctor you see but has your child been bitten by a dog asked mr bryany acutely perplexed you'd almost think so wouldn't you edward henry replied carefully non-committal what price going to the turk's head now he remembered with satisfaction and yet with misgiving a remark made to him a judgment passed on him by a very old woman very many years before this discerning hag the widow hullins by name had said to him briefly well you're a queer un three within five minutes he was following mr bryany into a small parlour on the first floor of the turk's head a room with which he had no previous acquaintance though like most industrious men of affairs in metropolitan hambridge he reckoned to know something about the turk's head mr bryany turned up the gas the turk's head took pride in being a hostelry and while it had accustomed itself to incandescent mantles on the ground floor it had not yet conquered a natural distaste for electricity and edward henry saw a smart dispatch box a dress suit a trouser stretcher and other necessaries of theatrical business life at large in the apartment i've never seen this room before said edward henry take your overcoat off and sit down will you said mr bryany as he turned to replenish the fire from a bucket it's my private sitting-room whenever i'm on my travels i always take a private sitting-room it pays you know of course i mean if i'm alone when i'm looking after mr sachs of course we share a sitting-room edward henry agreed lightly i suppose so but the fact was he was very much impressed he himself had never taken a private sitting-room in any hotel he had sometimes felt the desire but he had not had the face as they say down here to do it 
to take a private sitting-room in a hotel was generally regarded in the five towns as the very summit of dashing expensiveness and futile luxury i didn't know they had private sitting-rooms in this shanty said edward henry mr bryany having finished with the fire fronted him shovel in hand with a remarkable air of consummate wisdom and replied you generally can get what you want if you insist on having it even in this shanty edward henry regretted his use of the word shanty the inhabitants of the five towns may allow themselves to twit the historic and excellent turk's head but they do not extend the privilege to strangers and in justice to the turk's head it is to be clearly stated that it did no more to cow and discourage travellers than any other provincial hotel in england it was a sound and serious english provincial hotel and it linked century to century said mr bryany america's the place for hotels yes i expect it is been to chicago no i haven't mr bryany as he removed his overcoat could be seen politely forbearing to raise his eyebrows of course you've been to new york edward henry would have given all he had in his pockets to be able to say that he had been to new york but by some inexplicable negligence he had hitherto omitted to go to new york and being a truthful person except in the gravest crises he was obliged to answer miserably no i haven't mr bryany gazed at him with amazement and compassion apparently staggered by the discovery that there existed in england a man of the world who had contrived to struggle on for forty years without perfecting his education by a visit to new york edward henry could not tolerate mr bryany's look it was a look which he had never been able to tolerate on the features of anybody whatsoever he reminded himself that his secret object in accompanying mr bryany to the turk's head was to repay mr bryany in what coin he knew not yet for the aspersions which at the music hall he had cast upon england in general and upon the five towns in particular and also to get revenge for having been tricked into believing even for a moment that there was really a case of hydrophobia at bleakridge it is true that mr bryany was innocent of this deception which had been accomplished by robert brindley but that was a detail which did not trouble edward henry who lumped his grievances together for convenience he had been reflecting that some sentimental people unused to the ways of paternal affection in the five towns might consider him a rather callous father he had been reflecting again that nelly's suggestion of blood poisoning might not be as entirely foolish as feminine suggestions in such circumstances too often are but now he put these thoughts away reassuring himself against hydrophobia anyhow by the recollection of the definite statement of the encyclopaedia moreover had he not inspected the wound as healthy a wound as you could wish for and he said in a new tone very curtly now mr bryany what about this little affair of yours he saw that mr bryany accepted the implied rebuke with the deference properly shown by a man who needs something towards the man in possession of what he needs and studying the fellow's countenance he decided that despite its brassiness and simple cunning it was scarcely the countenance of a rascal well it's like this said mr bryany sitting down opposite edward henry at the centre table and reaching with obsequious liveliness for the dispatch box he drew from the dispatch box which was lettered w c b first a cut glass flask of whisky with a patent stopper and then a spacious box of cigarettes i always travel with the right sort he remarked holding the golden liquid up to the light it's safer and it saves any trouble with orders after closing time these english hotels you know so saying he dispensed whisky and cigarettes there being a siphon and glasses and three matches in a match-stand on the table here's lukin he said with raised glass and edward henry responded in conformity with the changeless ritual of the five towns i looks and they sipped whereupon mr bryany next drew from the dispatch box a piece of transparent paper i want you to look at this plan of piccadilly circus and environs said he now there is a piccadilly in hambridge also a pall mall and a chancery lane the adjective metropolitan 
applied to Hambridge is just. London? questioned Edward Henry. I understood London when we were chatting over there. With his elbow he indicated the music hall somewhere vaguely outside the room. London, said Mr. Bryany. And Edward Henry thought, what on earth am I meddling with London for? What use should I be in London? You see the plot marked in red, Mr. Bryany proceeded. Well, that's the site. There's an old chapel on it now. What do all these straight lines mean? Edward Henry inquired, examining the plan. Lines radiated from the red plot in various direction. Those are the lines of vision, said Mr. Bryany. They show just where an electric sign at the corner of the front of the proposed theatre could be seen from. You notice the site is not in the circus itself, a shade to the north. Mr. Bryany's finger approached Edward Henry's on the plan, and the clouds from their cigarettes fraternally mingled. Now you see by those lines that the electric sign of the proposed theatre would be visible from nearly the whole of Piccadilly Circus, parts of Lower Regent Street, Coventry Street, and even Shaftesbury Avenue. You see what a sight it is, absolutely unique. Edward Henry asked coldly, Have you bought it? No. Mr. Bryany seemed to apologise. I haven't exactly bought it, but I've got an option on it. The magic word option wakened the drowsy speculator in Edward Henry, and the mere act of looking at the plan endowed the plot of land with reality. There it was. It existed. An option to buy it. You can't buy land in the West End of London, said Mr. Bryany sagely. You can only lease it. Well, of course, Edward Henry concurred. The freehold belongs to Lord Waldo. Now eight six months. Really? murmured Edward Henry. I've got an option to take up the remainder of the lease, with sixty-four years to run, on the condition I put up a theatre. And the option expires in exactly a fortnight's time. Edward Henry frowned and then asked, What are the figures? That is to say, Mr. Bryany corrected himself, smiling courteously, I've got half the option. And who's got the other half? Rose Euclid's got the other half. At the mention of the name of one of the most renowned star actresses in England, Edward Henry excusably started. Not the, he exclaimed. Mr. Bryany nodded proudly, blowing out much smoke. Tell me, asked Edward Henry confidentially, leaning forward, where do those ladies get their names from? It happens in this case to be her real name, said Mr. Bryany. Her father kept a tobacconist's shop in Cheapside. The sign was kept up for many years, until Rose paid to have it changed. Well, well, breathed Edward Henry, secretly thrilled by these extraordinary revelations. And so you and she have got it between you? Mr. Bryany said, I bought half of it from her some time ago. She was badly hard up for a hundred pounds, and I let her have the money. He threw away his cigarette, half smoked with a free gesture that seemed to imply that he was capable of parting with a hundred pounds just as easily. "'How did she get the option?' Edward Henry inquired, putting into the query all of the innuendo of a man accustomed to look at great worldly affairs from the inside. "'How did she get it? She got it from the late Lord Waldo. She was always very friendly with the late Lord Waldo, you know.' Edward Henry nodded. "'Why, she and the Countess of Chell are as thick as thieves.' You know something about the Countess down here, I reckon. The Countess of Chell was the wife of the supreme local magnate. Edward Henry answered calmly, We do. He was tempted to relate a unique adventure of his youth, when he had driven the Countess to a public meeting in his mule carriage, but sheer pride kept him silent. I asked you for the figures, he added, in a manner which requested Mr. Bryany to remember that he was the founder chairman and proprietor of the five towns universal thrift club one of the most successful business organizations in the midlands here they are said mr bryany passing across the table a sheet of paper and as edward henry studied them he could hear mr bryany faintly cooing into his ear of course rose got the ground rent reduced and when i tell you that the demand for theatres in the west end far exceeds the supply and the theatre rents are always going up, when I tell you that a theatre costing £25,000 to build can be let for £11,000 a year, and often £300 a week on a short term. 
and he could hear the gas singing over his head and also unhappily he could hear dr stirling talking to his wife and saying to her that the bite was far more serious than it looked and nelly hoping very audibly that nothing had happened to him her still absent husband and then he could hear mr bryany again when i tell you when you tell me all this mr bryany he interrupted with the ferocity which in the five towns is regarded as mere directness i wonder why the devil you want to sell your half of the option if you do want to sell it do you want to sell it to tell you the truth said mr bryany as if up to that moment he had told naught but lies i do why oh i'm always travelling about you see england one day america the next apparently he had quickly abandoned the strictness of veracity all depends on the governor's movement i couldn't keep a proper eye on an affair of that kind edward henry laughed and could i chance for you to go a bit oftener to london said mr bryany laughing too then with extreme and convincing seriousness you're the very man for a thing of that kind and you know it edward henry was not displeased by this flattery how much well i told you frankly what i paid i made no concealment of that did i now well i want what i paid it's worth it got a copy of the option i hope mr bryany produced a copy of the option i'm nothing but an infernal ass to mix myself up in a mad scheme like this said edward henry to his soul perusing the documents it's right off my line right bang off it but what a lark but even to his soul he did not utter the remainder of the truth about himself namely i should like to cut a dash before this insufferable patroniser of england and the five towns suddenly something snapped within him and he said to mr bryany i'm on those words and no more you are mr bryany exclaimed mistrusting his ears edward henry nodded well that's business anyway said mr bryany taking a fresh cigarette and lighting it it's how we do business down here said edward henry quite inaccurately for it was not in the least how they did business down there mr bryany asked with a rather obvious anxiety but when can you pay oh i'll send you a cheque in a day or two and edward henry in his turn took a fresh cigarette that won't do cried mr bryany i absolutely must have the money to-morrow morning in london i can sell the option in london for eighty pounds i know that you must have it must they exchanged glances and edward henry rapidly acquiring new knowledge of human nature on the threshold of a world strange to him understood that mr bryany with his private sitting-room and his investments in seattle and calgary was at his wit's end for a bag of english sovereigns and had trusted to some chance encounter to save him from a calamity and his contempt for mr bryany was that of a man to whom his bankers are positively servile here mr bryany almost shouted don't light your cigarette with my option oh, i beg pardon edward henry apologised dropping the document which he had creased into a spill there were no matches left on the table i'll find you a match it's of no consequence said edward henry feeling in his pockets having discovered therein a piece of paper he twisted it and rose to put it to the gas could you slip round to your bank and meet me at the station in the morning with the cash suggested mr bryany no i couldn't said edward henry well then what here you'd better take this the card reborn soothed his host and blowing out the spill which he had just ignited at the gas he offered it to mr bryany what this man mr bryany observing the peculiarity of the spill seized it and unrolled it not without a certain agitation he stammered do you mean to say he's genuine you'd almost think so wouldn't you said edward henry he was growing fond of this reply and of the enigmatic playful tone that he had invented for it but we may as you say look twice at a fiver continued edward henry but we're apt to be careless about hundred pound notes in this district i dare say that's why i always carry one but it's burnt only just the edge not enough to harm it if any bank in england refuses it return it to me and i'll give you a couple more in exchange is that talking well i'm dashed mr bryany attempted to rise and then subsided back into his chair 
i am simply and totally dashed he smiled weakly hysterically and in that instant edward henry felt all the sweetness of a complete and luscious revenge he said commandingly you must sign me a transfer i'll dictate it then he jumped up you're in a hurry i am my wife is expecting me you promised to find me a match edward henry waved the unlit cigarette as a reproach to mr bryany's imperfect hospitality four the clock of bleakridge church still imperturbably shining in the night showed a quarter to one when he saw it again on his hurried and guilty way home the pavements were drying in the fresh night wind and he had his overcoat buttoned up to the neck he was absolutely solitary in the long muddy perspective of trafalgar road he walked because the last tramcar was already housed in its shed at the other end of the world and he walked quickly because his conscience drove him onwards and yet he dreaded to arrive lest a wound in the child's leg should have maliciously decided to fester in order to put him in the wrong he was now as apprehensive concerning that wound as nelly herself had been at tea-time but in his mind above the dark gulf of anxiety there floated brighter thoughts despite his fears and his remorse as a father he laughed aloud in the deserted street when he remembered mr bryany's visage of astonishment upon increasing the note indubitably he made a terrific and everlasting impression on mr bryany he was sending mr bryany out of the five towns a different man he had taught mr bryany a thing or two to what brilliant use had he turned the purely accidental possession of a hundred pound note one of his finest inspirations an inspiration worthy of the great days of his youth yes he had had his hour that evening and it had been a glorious one also it had cost him a hundred pounds and he did not care he would retire to bed with a net gain of two hundred and forty one pounds instead of three hundred and forty one pounds that was all for he did not mean to take up the option the ecstasy was cooled now and he saw clearly that london and theatrical enterprises therein would not be suited to his genius in the five towns he was on his own ground he was a figure he was sure of himself in london he would be a provincial with the diffidence and the uncertainty of a provincial nevertheless london seemed to be summoning him from afar off and he dreamt agreeably of london as one dreams of the impossible east as soon as he opened the gate in the wall of his property he saw that the drawing-room was illuminated and all the other front rooms in darkness either his wife or his mother then was sitting up in the drawing-room he inserted a cautious latch-key into the door and entered the silent home like a sinner the dim light in the hall gravely reproached him all his movements were modest and restrained no noisy rattling of his stick now the drawing-room door was slightly ajar he hesitated and then nerving himself pushed against it nelly with lowered head was seated at a table mending the image of tranquillity and soft resignation a pile of children's garments lay by her side but the article in her busy hands appeared to be an undershirt of his own none but she ever reinforced the buttons on his linen such was her wifely rule and he considered that there was no sense in it she was working by the light of a single lamp on the table the splendid chandelier being out of action her economy in the use of electricity was incurable and he considered that there was no sense in that either she glanced up with a guarded expression that might have meant anything he said aren't you trying your eyes and she replied oh no then plunging he came to the point well doctor been here she nodded what does he say it's quite all right he did nothing but cover up the place with a bit of cyanide gauze instantly in his own esteem he regained perfection as a father of course the bite was nothing had he not said so from the first had he not been quite sure throughout that the bite was nothing then why did you sit up he asked and there was a faint righteous challenge in his tone i was anxious about you i was afraid didn't sterling tell you i had some business i forget i told him to anyhow important business 
it must have been said nelly in an inscrutable voice she rose and gathered together her paraphernalia and he saw that she was wearing the damnable white apron the close atmosphere of the home enveloped and stifled him once more how different was this exasperating interior from the large jolly freedom of the empire music hall and from the whisky cigarettes and masculinity of that private room at the turk's head it was he repeated grimly and resentfully very important and i'll tell you another thing i shall probably have to go to london he said this just to startle her it will do you all the good in the world she replied angelically but unstartled it's just what you need and she gazed at him as though his welfare and felicity were her sole preoccupation i meant that i might have to stop there quite a while he insisted if you ask me she said i think it would do us all good so saying she retired having expressed no curiosity whatever as to the nature of the very important business in london for a moment left alone he was at a loss then snorting he went to the table and extinguished the lamp he was now in darkness the light in the hall showed him the position of the door he snorted again oh very well then he muttered if that's it i'm hanged if i don't go to london End of chapter 2